Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV and welcome to Forbidden Planet TV new releases. Uh, I'm here today with uh, um, Laura Dodd, Forbidden Planet's book buyer, and I'm well, privileged to be joined by Barnsley's finest, uh, Joanna Harris, MBE. How are you today, Joanna? I'm just fine, thank you. So, um, so uh, it, it, here at New Releases, we're talking about your, your new release, Orfea, and I know that, um, am I pronouncing that right, Joanne? I think so. I mean, it's an invented word, so you can pronounce it any way you like, but it's a kind of gender-flicked version of Orpheus, and, and it's, also a, it's also a bit of a play on words, and so I think, I think that's, that's right. That's how I'd say it. Oh, good, good. I'm, 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 I'm glad I tuned into that. Laura, I, I know that you're, you're very excited about this release. Uh, yes, yeah, it's another uh, stunning, stunning work from Joanne and the cover in particular, um, so I know that you've worked with Bonnie Helen Hawkins before on some of your other covers. How did you um, come across her work? Um, I have I have worked with Bonnie before, although the cover, this one here, is is by Sue Gent, who worked for Ryan, who has done the cover of my other novellas and also my Loki books. Um, actually, that's not true. Um, a guy called Andreas Price did my Loki books, but uh, she's working on something else. So I've worked with Sue for a bit, but the internal illustrations, these, mm -hmm. which oh, are lovely. utterly yeah. stunning, are by, by Bonnie Hawkins. And, um, and I got to working with her with a book of mine called A Pocket Full of Crows, um, which I wanted to be an illustrated book for adults. Mm -hmm. And... Um, my publishers didn't come up with anybody who was available who I thought had quite the right style um, and I was kind of dithering and thinking well you know I don't want to be a prima donna about this but I do want a certain kind of illustrator I want somebody who can do something feminine and soft and slightly old-fashioned like you know like the the grand tradition of illustrated fairy books from 100 years ago and, and there just wasn't anybody doing that and then I got in the post um, a drawing by a woman I'd never heard of saying, look, I don't know any of your books, but I heard your TED talk about stories and, and actually I'm an artist and, and here's one of my pictures. And I thought, my God, this is, this is amazing. I just, I want her to illustrate my book. Mm -hmm. um, it turned out she wasn't a professional artist at all. She'd never done a book illustration. She was very, very nervous at my suggestion that she should do the book, but she did a great job of it. And um, this is my third book with her. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's getting better and better. Or fair is is I think possibly her most creepy and ambitious and beautiful work so far. <laughs> well, that's quite a testament. <laughs> it's a testament I, there. It's, it's um, such a beautiful art to have that collusion of uh, creepiness and beauty. I think mm -hmm. is uh, is um, it, when you when you get that just right, it's such an appealing thing to delve into. And it strikes me the great thing about her work is it's very very layered. You know so. So you've got those entry points into it, but there's so much to look at on the page. There is, and I wanted that because although this is a fairy story and it is an illustrated book, it is absolutely not soft and fluffy and Disney-fied. It's, it's a very dark story. It's not for children. Um, and I wanted to get that kind of nuance in there because it's, it's, it's easy to miss it. It's a story about death. It's a story about grief. It also happens to have fairies in it and you're talking tigers and all kinds of stuff, but they're very dark fairies. They're, they're, they're creepy fairies with, with sort of insectile elements to them. They are not the kind of fairy you want to see at the bottom of your garden ever. And, and I, I, wanted, I wanted somebody who understood that and who got it and, and she does. She's very, and she's also very versed in that tradition of classic illustration, um, which is a bonus because there are very few fairy painters around anymore that that really kind of get it yeah are you yes. are you familiar with charles vess's work absolutely in fact yeah. he's he is illustrating my new book fantastic um, has been <laughs> illustrating it now for about six years because bless him he's not the quickest no he's not but the he fastest is, he is one of the best yeah and he's, he's he amazing. is um Yes, my, I have a book of 100 short stories coming out next year and Charles is illustrating them and I've been watching his process over, over some years now and I'm getting excited because he's now getting to the colouring stage and, yeah. and, you know, unless he sees something shiny and goes off in pursuit of it, I will have my illustrations by the end of the year and I'm just <laughs> really, really excited to see them. 
Oh, that that's going to be so fun. I, 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 I hadn't appreciated that. He's such a great fit for your work. He's such a he wonderful is. artist. I can really he is, and see He's a him. great character too. He's, he really he's is. Lovely. Yeah. I, I stayed uh, with him for a month on Sky a few years ago. Oh, and, wonderful. Uh, and we kind of bonded. And he's a fairy painter for a reason. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Like, I mean, like Brian Froud. He, he yes, believes in yes. fairies. He sees what he paints. Yeah, uh, Charles is actually the first person that I ever interviewed as a professional journalist years ago. And he did, he'd just done a Spider-Man graphic novel, which was a furry version, you know, Spirits called Spirits yeah. of the Earth. And that can yeah, those two things. Yeah, Spider-Man, it's great. Yeah, it's lovely. It's got those beautiful end papers in the book, very much like... Beautiful. You know, yeah, yeah, he's, so he's very much one of a kind. Yeah. So, so um, Orphea is a gender-flipped retelling of the Orpheus myth. What, what, is, what is it that, that spoke to you about that and what drew you to, what drew you to writing it? Well, I've been looking at traditional folk tales, mythology, fairy stories. I've mostly been looking at the child ballads, which if you, if you don't know what they are, you wouldn't be alone in this because a lot of people know Grimm's fairy tales, but they don't know the child ballads, which are effectively the, the Grimm's fairy tales of the British Isles in North America. And A Pocket for Crows was based on a child ballad, and so was The Blue Salt Road, and so is Orphea. It's, it's, it's based on, on two child ballads, actually. One is King Orpheo, which is a sort of Celtic version, if you like, of Orpheus, set in Middle England, strangely, and with some fairy tale elements to it, which I liked. And, and the other one is... Um, uh, a ballad called The Elfin Knight, which exists in a lot of different variants. And I kind of mushed them together and feminized them because the way I've been working with these ballads is trying to bring them something contemporary. And usually that is looking at the roles of women, because very often in the child ballads, in a lot of mythology and folklore, actually, the role of woman is to be the victim. And I wanted to, to have women with active roles. I wanted to have women who get their own back, women who have their own story. And in this case, with, with Orfea, my heroine is not, not only a woman, but she is also an older woman. She's a mother. And, and having a look at the way contemporary fiction works, most of the female protagonists are very young women or teenagers. Um, the mothers, the, the women of maternal age don't tend to get much of a look in you know they there's a kind of big gap even if we look at Hollywood we've got the young lead and then we've got the the game old bird who's in her 70s played by Helen Mirren and in the middle there's not much and I thought well you know what happened to all these women what where where are their stories and so I wanted to tell a story like that and so I made it a story about a mother and a mother's grief a mother who's lost her daughter um and I gave her an adventure which took me through the Elfin Night, through King Orfeo, through Fairyland, onto a train, because that happens, um, into the land of death, um, and then into a kind of epic riddling uh, contest with the King of Death, who, who pops up quite a lot in my stories, and, and who some of my readers will possibly know. Fantastic. Oh, I can't wait. Look, Laura, over to you. Uh, yes, yeah, I was going to mention about your kind of very poetic style of writing, which particularly kind of suits stories of the fae and folklore. Um, have you always had an interest in this from an early age? Always, yes. I've always loved folk tales, fairy tales, ballads. And there is a certain way of telling folk tales, I think. And, and I say telling because, of course, the oral tradition came first. And so there's... There is a style that I use when I'm writing these stories that isn't quite the same style as my other books. And I do it consciously, but also naturally. And I, I sort of blame Twitter for this because most of my fairy stories were started in some way and sometimes completely written on Twitter. And Twitter is not only a lovely kind of middle ground between the oral tradition and the written tradition, but it also forces you to stay succinct. And I have been telling stories on Twitter for six or seven years. Um, this is where I got my hundred stories, which are going to be published in Honeycomb next year. Um, most of them were actually written live on Twitter in front of whoever wanted to watch it happening. Um, but I developed a style then, which was partly a telling style and partly a very succinct narrative style, so you, you can look at, at the way Orfea is written and 
most of those sentences are basically tweets. Every mm -hmm. word has been placed in a particular way to make the sentence stand alone. Um, and I do that on purpose. And because I've been doing it such a long time, it now comes kind of naturally. But that's why these stories sound as if they should be told aloud. And in mm -hmm. fact, I narrated the audiobook, so you know that that's that's the natural home to me of, yeah. of any story is an audiobook and and so you you can hear me tell it if you like as well as reading it and looking at the pictures which which are another dimension to storytelling mm -hmm. of course and and an important one well i i think uh, i think a very interesting thing that you've done uh and uh, and of course not everybody has done this or done it as successfully as you have it is really embrace social media and current technology in terms of how we get stories out there and make it part of your process. And I, and I think you're one of the most successful examples of somebody who's actually done that and, and built that into the narratives that you weave and create. Well, I'm glad you think that because I like social media and, and in spite of, of all its awful <laughs> downsides, to me, social media is the natural home of storytelling in some ways because it's the new oral tradition Yes, yeah. Mm. I think that's Twitter is made for stories, particularly Twitter. Yeah. Um, and the stories mm. spread very fast. Yeah. So you've got these little micro fictions popping out on Twitter all the time. And some of them are also reality micro fictions, but it's, it's a very easy way to, to connect with an audience. It, it's, not, it's not a great way to sell books. It, it's not <laughs> the domain of the salesman at all, but it is... It is where storytellers feel at home. Yeah, I think that I think that's I think that's very interesting. Um, when you look, when you when now that you have your copy of Book Fair in your hand and you, and you look at the book, what is it that you what is it you feel the most proud of in terms of this particular work? Well, I don't know. Um, I'm just you know I've written twenty odd books and I'm still just thrilled to hold one in my hand and see it on the shelf but it was a bit of a hard sell all of these novellas were a hard sell personally I love the novella length it's a mm -hmm. really good way to tell a linear story without too many subplots sub characters it's it's a good way of approaching a certain kind of storytelling but you know I was told when I started with a pocket full of crows that novellas weren't all that popular they didn't sell much adults didn't want illustrated books and I was adamant that I wanted it to be an illustrated book um you know fantasy um do my fans really like fantasy will they will they buy these stories and and you know this is the third one and then i'm still there and people are still reading them and people still enjoy them and get a kick out of them which is great this one particularly was a bit of a tough one to write because behind this story of grief and a mother there is also the story that i wrote about in 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 my book, The Strawberry Thief, the one about a mother seeing a child grow up and leave and the absence that that leaves. And I know it's not the same kind of grief, but it is something that is particularly unique and poignant to being a parent. And so quite a lot of that found its way into Orfea. Um, and Bonnie, of course, bless her, particularly with these end pages, she actually used a portrait of my daughter as the starting point for that. And so it, it just became more and more about something personal to me as expressed through fairy tale, which is actually exactly what fairy tales are for. Fairy tales are for telling the stories that we don't feel comfortable talking about directly without looking through the lens of fantasy and metaphor. I think that is absolutely right and, and such a beautiful way to put it as well. Um, this, you have been watching, this has been FPTV New Releases and we've had the privilege of talking to Joanne Harris about her latest release, Orfea, which you're going to be able to order from the links attached to this video. Thanks very much for joining us, Joanne. Thank you.